with listening to the words of the hymns we sang this morning and now our special music. And I don't know if you could follow this theme that came through this morning and the words of this being close to our Savior. If you couldn't follow it, go back and read those words in the psalm, in the hymns. It's, it really is something we need to hang on to. And this morning when we're in Daniel and we see catastrophes and, and end of times events, this is what we need to hang on to, all of us. So I'm thankful for great hymns because they give us scripture and in poetic form that we get to just rehearse and replay in our ears and our minds. So do that on your own time. It's, it's good to do. I'm glad you're here this morning. I think hopefully you will hear God speak this morning as we do the second and last part of Daniel chapter 7. That's where we are this morning, Daniel chapter 7. And as you get there, I'm going to read for us 11 through 28. That'll be the entire last half of Daniel chapter 7. If you can't hear me well enough, you need to put your hand up and then uh, the sound booth back there will let you know. I can hear myself. So, okay. <laughs> hey, uh, let's see. Starting in verse 11. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me. And the visions in my head kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will rise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devour, devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be giving into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. 
word of prayer. Jesus, I thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word and that it is ever present and active and always truthful. I thank you because we can gather here and we can read it and we can ponder it. And so I ask that your spirit would enlighten us, our minds, our hearts, and that we would be moved to action in our own lives as we listen and as we study this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted just to back up to a few words in verse 10. We did this last week. There were some words that caught my eye because in verse 10, it says, a river was flowing, coming from before him, this is God, Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Did that not catch your attention last week? The books were opened. To me, it did. Because for some of us, we just go right by that. The books were opened, and on, on we go. For others, you may have been pondering, what are these books? Apparently, there's more than one. Several books. But why books? Does God write things down in books? Does he forget? Does he need to write them down? See, these are why you should wonder when you read. So I want to spend a few moments on this, this idea here. Now, keep in mind, God is spirit, right? He knows all things, okay? So he doesn't need help remembering anything. Right? It follows. That's his logic. So God, as a spirit, he isn't served by material things like a pen and paper, like we are. So the imagery is used here, I think, because we humans use books. And we understand the image. The image is not for God. The image is for us. So that's okay. If you think about banks, especially historically, banks in particular had books. And what did they keep in the books? Lots of things. Some people here know exactly what they kept in them. But banks would keep loans written down, deeds, estates, land. They would keep down the money you had and the money that you owed. All of those things were kept in the books. And if you went to them, they would open them and they would tell you what was in the books. Similar idea. Now, don't get, wrong, don't get me wrong. I am not affirming that these books are simply a metaphor. They are written in here. But that if God uses actual divine books, they're more for our human understanding than for his. Does that make sense? I'm sorry? He, and ultimately, excellent point. In the end, if ever we were credulous and say, hey, 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 I'm not sure that's true, he could show us in the book, but I don't think we'll ever get to that point. <laughs> when I see the throne room and the books opened, everybody will be on a knee. So if you spend some time this morning searching your Bible for these divine books, you might discover at least two kinds of books are mentioned in the Bible. I've done the work for you, but I'm going to let you know, okay? The book of life contains the names of those who will spend eternity with God. This is the book of life. While the other book contains our deeds as believers for which we will get rewarded. You will find this in scripture, separate books, separate things. If your name is not written in the book of life, you will spend your eternity in a lake of fire, flames, forever separated from the creator. This is in the Bible. None of your deeds will receive any reward anyhow. So the book of deeds is for believers. Now, I always like to Bring us back to scripture. And if you'd like to turn to Exodus chapter 32. All the way back, all the way back to Exodus chapter 32. And 
I will read verse 30 through 35, Exodus chapter 32. The story will be familiar to you. And on the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, this people have committed a great sin, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sin, very well. But if not, please wipe me out of your book, which you have written. However, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe out my book, wipe him out of my book. But go now, lead the people where I told you, behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, on the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord struck the people with the plague because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. There is a book. God had the book already from the beginning. You need your name in that book. That's very important. And the idea of God's book of our deeds is not a New Testament concept. I want you to see that. It's from Exodus. It's from the very start. And what you learn is that other people cannot pay for your sin. That's what it just said right there. They will pay for their sin. God will punish. God will judge. So you can forget the idea that you might spend some time in purgatory or a, a cosmic room waiting for other people to pay for you, for their good deeds to outweigh your bad deeds. If you read the Bible, you cannot find that. In fact, you will find the opposite. You will pay for your own sins. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, I know, all the way at the other end. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus himself makes this statement saying, The one who overcomes will be clothed in the same way, in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Notice the book of life, your name having to be written in it. This isn't a made-up idea. This is very important, and we'll emphasize that this morning. There are a few more details given about this throne room. So let me jump back to Daniel. I'm sorry, I'm making you move around here. Back in Daniel, when we were reading this morning, it talks about the throne room and the Ancient of Days who takes his seat and his vesture was white like snow and his hair on his head pure wool and the throne ablaze with fire. This is in Daniel. That was verse 9. In Revelation 20, though, we have a few more details I wanted to bring this morning. Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11, it says, And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and the heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I spent a little bit longer on this idea of books than you might have thought about, but I want you to see there are books and they rep represent eternity for us. Eternity is written in the book for each one of us. Eternity with God or eternity without God. That's why the books are important this morning. Okay, back in Daniel now, verse 11. I kept looking. I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. 
And I think in Daniel's case, it's understandable. He is sitting in front of God's universal throne, this amazing vision right before him, surrounded by millions and millions of angels, mighty angels. This is what he is seeing in, in his eye right now. And fire and judgment are pouring out. And Daniel must be completely amazed that there's this little horn over here on one side just speaking arrogant things against God. Can, can you see the scene? This mighty, mighty God and this little tiny horn over here. You'd be amazed too. What, what is this thing going on? Or how can that thing can be so dumb? You know, something like that. that. That's what I would think. And so in 13 and 14, you know, he's looking at it and he says, okay, I kept looking. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming up to the Ancient of Days. And he was presented before him. And he was given glory and dominion and a kingdom that doesn't end. What is this picture? God is on his throne. Judgment is coming. There's this little crazy horn over here talking. And then the Son of Man comes up. The Son of Man is Jesus. He is Jesus. He is coming. Why is he coming to, to God right now? Have you wondered that as you're reading? What's happening? Well, if you've studied, he is giving, he's being given his kingdom. Jesus is receiving his rightful kingdom. Judgment is being passed. The kingdom is being given. This is a coronation event. And everybody is standing there. It's amazing. If you look at that passage. So unlike the four beasts and every human empire that are passing away into dust in just a few short years, Christ's kingdom here says is everlasting. That means no end. It, it is and it continues. And it will be for all people, all people. Satan, his demons, the short-lived evil men, they will never get close to victory, not even close. I don't know why they, I, I don't know why Satan doesn't read the Bible like we do. I, I wondered that. I mean, you have to wonder that. He's super smart and he's lived a long time. But apparently God may have blinded him. Or his pride may have blinded himself. In any case, we see the end, and he apparently doesn't. I, we know the end, and this is why there's hope for us this morning. In 15 and 16, if you read, keep going along here, this is the, as for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me by the visions. I like this because we studied Daniel, and we know that in Daniel, in Scripture, we know he's highly educated, highly educated, very intelligent, has wisdom beyond most people such that he can, he can decipher the greatest enigmas. And God has given him the spirit where he can explain visions and dreams. But Daniel can't figure this out. <laughs> he sees something he can't figure out. Have you thought about that? So let this be a caution to the rest of us for just a second. When we jump into prophecy, when we look at end times, when we start getting all the, the charts and everything together, remember, Daniel didn't understand it all. I just want you to keep that in mind, okay? Daniel didn't get the whole revelation either. And the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, didn't understand it all either. Okay, just keep that in mind. So that this is good for us because it keeps us from trying too hard where even the greatest couldn't. We will know what we need to know when it's time. Of that, you can be sure. So Daniel's standing there. I think he's kind of, to me, I, he's like a lost traveler. He turns to a bystander and says, wait a minute here. What is going on exactly? You're here. Maybe you can tell me. And one of the angels standing there says, okay, here's a summary. Let me give you a short summary. And that's what 17 and 18 are, a short summary. 
the great beasts, which are four in number, the kings which will arise. I don't want to read it again for you. It's right there, but we've covered it before. The four beasts correspond to the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the, per the Greek, and then finally the Roman empires. They all succeed each other. And in the end, we find that Jesus Christ conquers all, takes his rightful and long-awaited place as king over all. That's what you find here. It's a nice summary. It's neat. But again, Daniel is very human. I like that. Daniel's like, yeah, 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 I get all that. But wait a minute. <laughs> I get that. There's still this little horn. What is the little horn doing? Oh, come on. You'd be like that, too. You'd be like, okay, I get the big picture. But this thing here. I want, he says, I, I need another explanation. Like, my mind can't comprehend all of this massive stuff going on and then this, this, this little guy over here that just can't stop. That, that's how I view it. Maybe you don't. He says, okay, so it gets to the crazy part because I, need, <laughs> I want to understand that part. And this is, this is what the angel says. He says, okay, so verse 21. And I kept looking, and that whore was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Did you read that last week, and did that strike you at all? Overpowering them. What do you make of that? For sure, Daniel, he would have looked at that and said, wait a minute, that doesn't look good. He's been in that. He's been a captive already. That doesn't look good. And there is a sense in which the future ruler, which we have identified previously as the Antichrist, will in some sense prevail against the saints who are still on earth. That's what it says. And we will find other places that support this idea. During the tribulation times and at the end, the Christians will be no match for the Antichrist and his empire. It's, it's predicted. It's not me making this up. It's predicted. But that's okay because verse 22 says, until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed. Passed for what? In favor of the saints. Oh, so there's a, there's a time set in God's eternal calendar, if you like. It is set in stone. It is set. God will not change his mind. God has an exact day when the human time is up. And for the Antichrist, for sure, there is an exact time. You don't need to worry when it's going to be. There is a, it is set. When God says enough evil has been played out, enough people have been given the full opportunity to follow Jesus instead of, of the world in their own ways. There is a time. In verse 24, I'm sorry, 23 and 24, this is the fourth beast that Daniel wants to know about. The fourth be beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from the others. It will devour the whole earth, tread it down. And then as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, tens will... And kings will arise, and another will arise. Okay, this is, this is the meat. Give me this part. He's going he's to explain it. So the angel fills in just a few more details. As we know, the Roman Empire did indeed crush every other country and empire before it. Lasted a thousand years. In fact, in the Roman Empire's time, the apostles all died. Have you thought of that? Oh, yeah. Those teeth of iron, it did its job. Definitely did its job. The challenge for us here is that we're talking about, uh, Daniel's talking about Old Testament empires, Testament empires, that came and went, and all of a sudden it shifts to the future. You have to look carefully. It shifts right here. Now he's talking about the little horn in the future. So we have some things that have taken place. There are still some things that need to come. We see the Antichrist will create a coalition, we'll say, a federation of ten nations in the future. And shortly after that, he's going to cheat, betray three of them, and take control over the whole thing. That's, that's, in, that's in here. It's going to happen. Now, we have to be careful because throughout history, people like Stalin, Hitler, 
Gorbachev, remember he had the thing there on the, the, the mark on his head, or even Obama have been thought of as being that's going to be this leader. We had to be careful because people do that in every generation. And if we look back, it, it wasn't them. So, so let's not be too quick here. And if you're old enough, you will remember there was a time when as the European Union was being founded, well, they're thinking European Union, it's the end, it's part of the Roman Empire, these are the Europeans, European Union's coming back together. Ah. It was founded in 1957, maybe you guys didn't remember that, with just six countries, six. By 1973, there were nine. So by 1973, there were lots of books written, lots of conferences you could have gone to, because what about when the tenth one joins? You see, ten. Well, you know a little bit of history and where we are today, you know that at least one of them left the union and today we have 22. So it doesn't fit anymore. Again, this is my word of warning, caution. You can buy all the books you want, but I'm just, we have to be a little bit cautious. Again, Daniel didn't know everything either, and we don't either. That's all I'm here to tell you, okay? Um, it's fascinating to study. I will grant you that. Verse 25. This is the, the, the little horn. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints, looking to make alterations in times and in law. Did that grab your attention last week if you read ahead? That I find fascinating. What could that possibly mean? And maybe like Daniel, we have to wonder, uh, ponder a little bit, what could that possibly mean? Now, what does it mean? The, the saints are going to be worn down. I looked into the, the original language, worn out like a garment, like worn out, like erosion, worn down. And, and how will the Antichrist alter time itself? What is that? See, the Bible's like really exciting if you study it. It's pretty intense. Now, this is a great place for your mind to wander this afternoon, sitting in your favorite chair, reading this over once again. And you and I have seen plenty of advances in technology in the last 20 years, 30 years, lots of advances. Things that seemed impossible or more like science fiction now are actually part of our daily lives. It's weird, strange, completely part of our daily lives. We don't even think about them. But changing the times? Well, this will be interesting to you. I like to study, and in my studies, I found something interesting. If you went to the nation of Ethiopia today, you might find they have a different calendar. It's not the same that we have. In fact, in Ethiopia, the year is 2014, today. Ha <laughs> you didn't know that. Uh, maybe you did. <laughs> they use a 13-month calendar with 30 days in each, which for you math wizards is 360 days at 12 months. But they have a 13th month, which either has five or six days, depending on the leap year. Ha! Huh. So they make it work. I like that. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, if you went to Nepal, there is a Nepalese calendar. I didn't know that either. And it has 31 or 32 day months. Um, and they are in the year 2079 because they have more days in their months. I don't know. They're in the year 2079. See, this is fascinating stuff. Now, closer to our text, how do they change these things? Well, the little dictator in North Korea decided in 1997 to make a new calendar for North Korea. Now, if you don't travel there, you wouldn't know that. And they went back to the year of their founder, and they currently live in the year 112. Now, interestingly, that's still A.D., I mean, they had to start, <laughs> and they still use a calendar that looks a lot like ours. But they also celebrate three New Year's every year. <laughs> uh, how do you like that? Okay, 
that's maybe closer to changing the times. Maybe. But if you're in your verse 25 and you look at wearing down the saints, it appears to me at least that in the final days, the ruler will either try to alter time and space, which seems impossible to me, but who's to say what physicists will discover in the world of quantum physics, for instance? I don't know. It's just a thought. More likely, though, I believe they're going to work really well at abolishing Christian holidays, for instance. Christian events of all kinds. Christian dates that we have. All history that might have to do with the Bible. Let's just wipe that out. We can do that. We have the government. Sure. It's possible churches will be shuttered or just completely destroyed. It's certainly possible. Bibles will be banned. All printing might be distorted anyways, or no more printing of Bibles. Christian weddings, funerals, videos, educational materials, all gone. Well, those things are possible. Likely, with one person in charge that hates God. Yeah. So what happens when all of our life today is detailed and scheduled on your phone? When all your money is held in a virtual bank, when all of our history, all of our news is edited, parceled out by the whims of somebody else, what happens when the Internet is turned off? Oh, aren't those interesting thoughts? Yes, they are. Daniel couldn't have thought any of this. That's why his mind was completely blown. We're closer, and still it's not a particularly pleasant thing, is it? No, it's not. So now you can get a little bit of the understanding of when Daniel is alarmed and distressed, like maybe you're feeling right now. Okay. Now, there's no doubt Daniel tried to make sense of what he saw. He was super bright. And he may have speculated a little bit. Well, how is this one ruler, one world government going to work? How's it going to happen? Because it hadn't happened ever. Do you know that after World War II, Albert Einstein stated that we needed a one world government to prevent future world wars? Albert Einstein, he saw the horrors of it. He said, no, 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 the best remedy is one government. Oh, okay. But long before Einstein, the Italian philosopher Dante, in the 1200s, he believed that, and I'm going to quote him, if, if the whole earth and all that humans can possess be a monarchy, that is, one government under one ruler, then because he would possess everything, the ruler would not desire to possess anything further. And thus, he would hold kings contentedly within the borders of their kingdoms and keep peace among them. Because he would have everything, nobody would desire anything else. Dante, in the 1200s, see, the concept is old. Much, much later, 1795, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant reflected on this notion of a single leader on earth and hesitated because, and I will quote, the laws progressively lose their impact as the government increases its range and a soulless despotism after crushing the germs of goodness will finally lapse into anarchy. Now, my wife likes poetry and philosophy, so I'm going to read that again. <laughs> Plus, I have it written. It's easier for me, so hold on. The laws progressively lose their impact as the government increases its range, and a soulless despotism will, after crushing the germs of goodness, will finally lapse into anarchy. And he continues later, this world ruler would prove its end in the graveyard of freedom. Oh, yeah. Immanuel Kant. Well, let me tell you that in reading God's word, 
we know for certain what the outcome and future of a one world government is going to be. You know for sure what it's going to be. It says it in the word. And the only good solution for this world is for Jesus to remove the evil and install himself as the one perfect king. It can't work any other way. I don't care what philosophy you follow. It can't. So we're still in verse 25. And if you look carefully here, this, this evil man will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That is the strangest thing, isn't it? Maybe. The time of the great tribulation described in Revelation is a seven year period, future history. Daniel mentions, notice, time, times, half a time. Most Bible scholars understand this to equal three and a half times, or three and a half years, which coincides with the peak of the Great Tribulation, three and a half years. Now, you may say, how do you know this stuff? Well, because I read the Bible, <laughs> not because I make it up. So because I read the Bible and I want you to read the Bible, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 13. Some of you knew we were going to Revelation 13. And we're going to read this, eight verses. And, and while I read this, I want you to see how closely this vision from the Apostle John, let me calculate here, 100 Three, four hundred years later is just like this vision. Okay, Revelation 13, verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on, in, on his horns were ten crowns. And on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like one of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as, as if it had been fatally wounded, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? A mouth was given to him, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for, please note here, 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All who live on the earth will worship him, Everyone whose name has not been written since the foundation of the world. Look again here in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. Do you see the similarities? It's all there. The apostle John's vision paints a very similar end time picture, though this beast now incorporates parts of the other four. You can look at that and see the parts that are in there. And the beast in Revelation is given 42 months I'm not a great mathematician, but that ends up to be three and a half years. The same three and a half years. To do his worst work, three and a half years. And this is why most people understand Daniel's time, times, and time and a half to be three and a half years. Now, you can spend time and connect all these dots of these passages later on. It's good. It's a good exercise. But I want, and when you do that, when you take this Daniel passage and the Revelation 13, you're going to find in both cases, look at this, the beast is the leader. You'll find that. He opposes and blasphemes God. There are ten horns. He persecutes the saints. He seemingly has unlimited power for three and a half years and is ultimately destroyed by Jesus. You will see that. Spend the time, graph it out. So we're almost finished here. We've got to do verse 26. 
if you're back in Daniel. Well, verse 26 in the end. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away. Whose dominion? That's the beast. The court will sit. God's court will sit. Things are going to get really bad on earth. Really bad. But thanks to the visions that we have in the Bible that are given for us, we're given a preview of the end. We see the end. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to get anxious. We know what's going to happen. In the end, Jesus wins. That's what you need to know. Jesus wins. There was never really any doubt. But just so you know, in the end, Jesus wins. Okay? God will hold his court, the Antichrist, Satan, all his demons, and everybody who denied Christ will be judged. That is going to take place. There is a judgment coming for every man and every woman. If you choose to deny God and live as an atheist, then you place your belief, this is what you believe, as an atheist without God. When I die, I cease to exist. It's like I never was. I'm just no longer. I don't exist. That's what an atheist ultimately believes. You know, there's no, I came from nothing. I go to nothing. If you want to be an atheist, you got to live by that. There are some groups, uh, religious groups. They may include the Seventh-day Adventists that teach that when you die, if you're evil, you're simply annihilated. You cease to exist. Interesting. Except that's not biblical, is it? That's not what you just read. That is not what you will find in the Bible. They want people to just simply cease to be. But let me, there are two problems, at least, with this view. First, if we simply cease to exist, then there is actually never justice or punishment in this world. Think about it. You pick Hitler. You pick Stalin. You pick whoever you want. If Hitler just simply stopped existing, boom, poof, gone. It's like he never existed in the first place. There's no trace of him. Did he get punished? Did he pay for anything? No, he doesn't exist. You see? So that's a major problem with this. How do you reconcile that now with history, with life, with the own injustices you encounter? You can't. And neither can an atheist or somebody who says there's nothing after there. Well, then I'm sorry, you're going to have to deal with the fact that there's no justice in this universe. But that's not what the Bible says. No. So the second problem with this is, of course, all injustices that Christians have suffered, that Jesus suffered, would never be paid for. There would be no punishment if that was the true view. There's no punishment. You don't exist. There has to be punishment. God the perfect judge says there will be punishment. You will pay for the sins if you don't believe in Jesus. So justice will be served because we have a judge, the ultimate judge. No one escapes. Acts 17 will tell us this. You're welcome to turn there. Acts 17, 30 through 31. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent because, here it is, he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. Acts 17, 30 and 31. He has set a day. It's there. There is a day coming. It has been set. Now, let me tell you, life is tough. Life is tiring us out right now. If we follow Christ, it's not easy. But our end as Christians is held in God's hand. Right? That book of life, that's where your name is right now as a Christian. So I'm going to leave you with the same hope that comes from Scripture. I'm going to read you one last thing this morning. And you're going to just hold on to that. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28. And just as it is destined for people to die once, 
And after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. May that be us today. Amen.